Welcome to New Economic Thinking. I'm delighted to be here this morning with Eric Weinstein, who is Managing Director of Teal Capital, a mathematician and economist, and also a co-author of mine. We've worked together in the past on some mathematical and economic ideas. Eric, welcome. Thanks. It's great to be with you all again. I'm going to start by reading you a quote from a recent essay that you wrote for Edge.org. Capitalism and communism, which briefly resembled Victor and Vanquished, increasingly look more like Thelma and Louise, a tragic couple sent over the edge by forces beyond their control. What comes next is anyone's guess, and the world hangs in the balance. Do you really think market capitalism is dead? Uh, I can't say that I started out thinking that market capitalism uh, is dead, but I think I've been reluctantly pushed towards that conclusion. I think so many of the recent uh, reports uh, on our economy with uh, tech firms sitting on huge uh, cash war chests, um, buybacks, recoveries without um, much progress in terms of wages, the middle class continually losing ground, um, young people in, unable to start families and uh, the propensity for first home purchases decreasing are, are, have led me to question whether we have a million little fires that need to be put out or some sort of central uh, explanation. And I think that actually the world makes a lot more sense if we uh, think the unthinkable, which is that market capitalism was in fact uh, an accident of the 20th century and that um, there are certain preconditions that need to be present for it to function which we may have actually changed these conditions through technology not through rival ideology so that while market capitalism was always focused on totalitarian communism as its intellectual foe and dancing partner uh, in fact, it was its child technology that uh, may have actually done it in. So you believe it's really technology that is killing capitalism. In what way do you think this is happening? So this is really interesting. I think that there are probably a variety of ways in which this is happening. Um, on the one hand, um, software, uh, which is, I think, best understood by the people who code it, really excels at looped behavior. So whether it's a for loop or a while loop, uh, if you stop a computer program at random, um, it could stop either in the Rube Goldberg-like sections, which unfold once, never to be repeated, or in the parts that uh, continue to repeat the same behavior. And in fact, almost always it will end up in a loop because that's where the power of software comes from and that's where software spends most of its time. A lot of our training, in fact, almost all of the training that we know how to do repeatedly, like in medicine or law or accounting, is predicated on the idea of expertise, that we should teach people through a one-time uh, major investment in their education with a small amount of continuing education to keep them current, that they should do some looped, repetitive pattern uh, in the pursuit of expertise in a, in a field in order to feed themselves and, and their families. And I think that the problem is is that our educational system has maneuvered them into the, the crosshairs of software so that they are in fact training to do what software does best. And if you imagine, for example, a radiologist who's trained for many years in order to be able to make tricky diagnoses, um, potentially being obviated by a deep learning algorithm, and you'll have a tiny number of radiologists at the top of the profession uh, for the very tricky cases, but most of the work will be handled uh, by a machine. Um, this leads us to a very uncomfortable paradigm. I think the reason that few of us are talking about the death of capitalism is that we don't want to leave uh, the shore that we know uh, until we know there's some landmass that we can swim to. And there is, as yet, no ism, not communism, not socialism, not capitalism, that I see as capable of taking over the management of this complex emergent systems that we see in our cities and in our economies. Haven't we been concerned about technology obviating human labor for decades or maybe even centuries? Isn't this what we hear with each new technological innovation? And just as man has always dreamed of, uh, of flying, um, empirically that's something that you know was always impossible until it was achieved. And I think that 
part of the problem here is that if you go by the empirics, um, yes, it's always been false. But what's new is that software isn't threatening to obviate the lowest rep repetitive, lowest value repetitive behaviors. It's actually threatening to obviate all repetitive behaviors. So instead of moving people from low value repetition to higher value repetition, it's really threatening to move everyone who is in a repetitive framework into the only remaining thing that we have a definite edge over the machines uh, with, which is some sort of singular act, some act of uh, violent creation. And unfortunately, we have no known uh, educational system that imparts this ability. And in fact, in one of my favorite uh, films, Kung Fu Panda, um, the entire premise of the film is that a self-taught master has to pass the self-teaching torch to another. But the danger is, is that in teaching, we may crowd out the self-teaching modality. And so we have a really interesting educational puzzle, which is how do those who have proven an ability to create uh, and do something unprecedented pass that knowledge and that ability to others? Because the danger is that we'll actually crowd out the nascent ability uh, to create in our pupils. It's a very interesting view on the future and somewhat terrifying from the perspective of an economist. Um, we as economists have not really been thinking about things in terms like this before. And you and I have in the past talked about the economics of economics, mm -hmm. how economists think about things, what we've sometimes referred to as economics squared. Can you describe a little bit of what that phrase might mean and why it might be relevant? I believe that was, that was actually your phrase in trying to come up with a, with a label for this very important topic. Economists are unflinching uh, in the application uh, of their techniques to the fields of others, uh, to borrow uh, from Gary Becker's famous definition of economics. But the one area in which economists are extremely squeamish is talking about um, the political economy of economics itself. And so the question of what rent-seeking behavior should we expect from senior economists, or if the gains to selling uh, one's conclusions is higher from the private sector uh, than from academic work or the public sector, should we expect uh, that our conclusions will be biased. These are some of the most interesting and the most obvious questions to ask. Another question is, is macroeconomics even really possible? Um, there's a puzzle when you see a macroeconomist complaining about the time needed to apply for grants. Why, if you have deep insight into the world of macroeconomics, given the plethora of investable instruments, you don't have a trade expression uh, with which to make such a tidy sum that you'll never apply for a grant again. And so, um, while I don't usually hold with the idea, if you're so smart or so creative, why aren't you rich? It is particularly applicable in macroeconomics because the market is closest to being complete. And so one of our questions should be, um, how are the people who are getting to the helms of our government agencies that are responsible for printing statistics like CPI or GDP or central banks uh, where they're actually directing um, regulation of the money supply, how are these people getting there? Through proven abilities, through proxy abilities in the form of citations uh, and accolades, uh, or simply through sharp elbows over sharp minds? And I think that these are terrifying questions for the economics profession, but they're also exciting because they're exactly the same kind of questions the economists have asked of the workforce in general uh, and even neighboring fields, uh, and I'm thinking here of Richard Freeman's uh, investigations into the markets for mathematicians and physicists. Well, that's interesting because you came at the field as an outsider. You came with a mathematics background and ran into some of the incentive structures uh, within the economics profession. Within the Big Ten to find that um, many people are somewhat suspicious of the role of mathematics. What do you feel like we're getting wrong? What do you think that math has to offer that we might not be seeing? So it's a, it's a great question. I think that, first of all, we have to be honest with ourselves that a lot of math has crept in uh, for <clears throat> purposes of intimidation to make cryptic, which is otherwise simple, 
um, and to create a kind of uh, interference competition where the field could be uh, restricted to a smaller number of players. So I think that there's a tremendous amount of abuse of mathematics and I think that that's probably the right way for the INET energy to be funneled towards the abuse. But unfortunately it ends up too often funneled towards the mathematics itself where people have been brutalized by an instrument that in fact is not biased good uh, or bad. And I think um, one place where you can see uh, a difference is by asking that there be some sort of prose explanation for why a particular piece of mathematics needs to be introduced. So off the top of my head, one of the things that bothers me most is that uh, economists have all sorts of data typing problems. We call things by scalars that are actually fields. No one would accept the idea that the temperature in America yesterday was 70 degrees because we know we have Alaska, Hawaii, Florida, and Maine which are all likely to have different temperatures. But too often we're willing to say the rate of inflation is X uh, or you know, growth was Y in some particular quarter. So one of the problems is, is that you're feeding the wrong data types back into the models. This means you can't make use of the field concept which is used to regulate other self-regulating systems uh, as it is, let's say, in theoretical and particle physics. So one candidate would be, why is it that we've accepted that these models are prejudiced from inception to deliver certain kinds of con conclusions? Having a single scalar for inflation or growth obviously means that the gauge is susceptible to fiddling. But if you try to fiddle with an entire field, pro uh, that is a field concept, uh, it's almost impossible. So I would love to see um, more autonomous um, mathematics that is not quite so amenable to special pleading from powerful interests. You are sitting in Silicon Valley and from this perspective have a take on the economy and the economics profession that is somewhat tutored by uh, your position with respect to innovation and technology and having a bird's eye view as to um, what is going on in that area of the economy. What do we not understand about Silicon Valley as outsiders and what do you think Silicon Valley can teach us about the economics of innovation and the innovation of economics? Mm. It would appear that those two concepts are really closely tied. Um, in order for our economies to work, because our institutions are predicated on growth assumptions, it is imperative that there be a steady stream of innovations lest the growth predicated institutions uh, encounter steady state, uh, at which point they tend to uh, become extremely violent and rent seeking. So I think one of the things is that it has to be understood that in, in Silicon Valley um, things are extremely fluid uh, and that growth doesn't look here the way it looks uh, in a, at a statistical level uh, to a government agency in, back in Washington. It's much more violent. It's much harder to uh, describe what the process is. Um, it's something which is much more techne than episteme, uh, if you accept that division. Uh, some heterodox economists uh, talk about it. But I think that part of what's going on is, is that the economics of the future is being developed here by people who have no basic interest in economics. I don't know that, for example, who invented Bitcoin uh, or whether it was a collective, but I'm almost positive that it came out of this technological group rather than uh, some economist in an ivy-covered hall. Uh, and if you think about the invention of a form of digital gold, um, we are going to be creating the economics of the future here, whether we have permission or understanding from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts or Washington, D.C. So it's really imperative um, that better links be built between the valley uh, and the traditional uh, corridors of power because I think that there's a lot for each group to gain from the other. So when we think about Bitcoin, we come back to your question about macroeconomics and the issue of how much control we are actually going to have over our macroeconomics with people able to create currencies and create gold the way you talk about.
It's very interesting. I mean, imagine a future in which cryptocurrencies have uh, endogenous algorithmic central banking built in so that when recession threatens, uh, the money supply of the currency can actually be expanded uh, and then contracted at a later point, but without being subject uh, to the political economy of having humans at the helm. Uh, I think that what's really important to understand is that Silicon Valley, uh, as a name for modern innovation, is going to push us into realms in which no economics currently exists. What if, for example, by turning physical objects made of atoms into small files made of bits, we, what we do is push private goods into being public goods, because after all, a small file is inexhaustible and non-excludable, which is the very definition of a very pernicious kind of market failure. It's one thing if you have a small portion of the pie uh, made up of public goods and you have a large amount of private goods and services that, where taxes uh, levied can be used to pay for the public goods. But what happens when public goods come to dominate and market failure becomes the default expectation rather than the edge case. Which brings us back to this idea of the changing structure of our economy and how our models might not be applicable anymore to where we're going in the future. But then do we have any answers? Where does this leave us? What does the economy of the future look like? Well, I mean, I think this is one of the reasons I think it's so exciting uh, to be affiliated with INET and sort of visionaries uh, like Rob Johnson, Bill Janeway, George Soros, what have you. Uh, we, not, we now need to create such a thing. And in, there was a time around the crisis where perhaps it was acceptable to think in terms of heterodoxy and let a thousand flowers bloom. But right now we have an emergency. We have an ailing, uh, self-organized uh, economy that needs more direction. And we can't say what the new model is because we haven't built it. But I can't think of a better group to try to figure out what new economic thinking is uh, than INET. But it does mean that we have to start um, formalizing some of what we've learned through the heterodoxy. So I think some of the elements are going to be potentially a guaranteed minimum income. Uh, for the most value, most vulnerable, uh, and therefore it's going to have elements that look very socialistic. I think recognition that it, there are going to be a small number of players capable of really moving things forward, the Elon Musks of the world. So you're going to see power laws that are quite uncomfortable socially for many people. Um, so there's going to be probably greater inequality, but there's probably going to be a, have to be a stronger safety net. I think it's an extremely exciting and interesting problem but it's one that we have to realize we're facing before we're willing to roll up our sleeves to do it. Well, what comes next is anyone's guess and the world hangs in the balance. Eric, thank you so much for being with us this Thanks morning. Thanks for having me.